Uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the conference, Dominique Charpin and Antoine Jacquet, for inviting me to give a paper on the archival documents from Sousa. Being a bit of an outsider here, Sousa not being located in Babylonia, I will start this presentation with a short introduction on the geographical and chronological context, followed by an overview of the archival text from the first half of the second millennium known to have come from Susa, to end with a case study on the network of witnesses around a Susian called Nur Shushinak. So first, as you all know, Susa is located in the Khuzestan lowlands in southwestern Iran, an area very rich in settlements already in prehistoric times, many of which were inhabited throughout various millennia. From old, this area, geologically an extension of the Mesopotamian alluvial plain, has been a contact area between lowland Mesopotamia and the Iranian highlands to its east. These continuous interactions, both violent through warfare and raids, and diplomatic through trade and royal marriages, had a profound impact on both sides. Not only on both sides, but also, or even in particular, on the spaces in between, where the two entities border each other, the borderlands. Indeed, within the border area alongside the Zagros Mountains in modern western Iran, the millennia-long interaction and balancing between Mesopotamian lowland and Iranian highland traditions, values and influences resulted in a duality of cultures which evolved throughout time and still exists today. This holds particularly true for the city of Susa, where this evolving lowland-highland interaction can be observed during more than three millennia. And particularly interesting here is the first half of the second millennium, when some important changes took place that formed the basis for further evolution throughout the second and even first millennium. And this brings me to the second point, the chronological context. Traditionally, the Old Babylonian period in Mesopotamia is paralleled to the so-called Sukalmach dynasty in Susa, roughly the first half of the second millennium. However, contrary to what can be observed in Mesopotamia, no new dynasty or kingdom is founded at Susa at the beginning of the second millennium, nor does this dynasty or kingdom fall in the middle of it. In terms of political or state context, Susa seems to be characterized by relative continuity without significant interruptions from the end of the third millennium onwards. Indeed, the period that traditionally has been labeled Sukalmach dynasty is actually a continuation of the structure of the Elamite kingdom that emerged already during the latter part of the O3 empire in central Iran. When the Elamites started expanding their territory, they clashed with the Sumerians, whose eventual downfall they would, bring, they would help bring about. Already at the beginning of Ibiswen's reign, Susa was incorporated into this Elamite kingdom, the political structure and organization of which seems to have been that of a federal state, with the king as highest authority, under whom two Sukalmachs each ruled over part of the territory. Elam and Shimashki in the north, and Susa and Anshan in the south. And further down, lower officials, such as Sukals and Tepirs, supervised smaller territories or cities. So, whereas it was long believed that the Sukalmach dynasty, named after the Sukalmach as assumed highest authority, was founded by Ebarat II in Susa around 1950, it seems now that not only there was more than one Sukalmach, and that they were deputies of the Elamite king, but also that this system was already in place under the Shemashkin king, Idatu I. The basis of this misconception lies in the fact that the vast majority of our sources to reconstruct the history of second millennium Elam come from one single side, namely Susa. And this has long generated a biased Susa-centric view not only on the political context in which Sousa was embedded in this period, but also on cultural, economic, religious, and linguistic characteristics of its society. After all, Sousa was but one, albeit a very important center within this vast Elamite state, moreover located at its western fringe in a historical borderland. 
As already mentioned, contrary to the Mesopotamian situation, no significant interruptions are noticeable in the written record, and the Elamite kingdom continues to exist throughout the second half of the second millennium, although the three power level structure seems to be abandoned, or at least the titulature changes. So, let us have a look at the archival text from Susa that can be dated in the first half of the second millennium when the three power level structure reigned and which I will call Sukalmach period for convenience. Up to now, more than 1,300 archival documents dating from the Sukalmach period are known to be found in Susa. These have been unearthed in various parts of the Acropolis and the royal city of Susa by the French archaeological mission between the 1890s and the 1960s under the direction of Jacques de Morgan, Roland de Mekinem, and Roman Girschmann. Around uh, 750 tablets were found at the beginning of the 20th century by de Morgan on the Acropolis and in the 1930s by de Mekinem in two soundings on the southern border of the royal city. These have been published by Georges Dossin and Vincent Scheil in six volumes of the series MDP. Nowadays, roughly half of them is kept at the National Museum in Iran in Tehran and half at the Louvre here in Paris. Some of them are unfortunately untraceable. The online catalogue of the Louvre mentions some 30 more tablets and fragments of tablets with ceilings on them from Susa, dated, according to the catalogue, to either the Sukalmak dynasty or the first dynasty of Babylon, for which no publication in MDP or elsewhere is mentioned, implying probably they also are still unpublished. Around 550 tablets were excavated between 1946 and 1967 by Roman Girschmann in two soundings in the royal city, the large sounding A in the north, consisting of 15 stratigraphical levels, and the smaller sounding B in the south with five stratigraphical levels, two of which contemporaneous with the oldest levels of A. 468 were unearthed in levels 12 to 15 of sounding A to be dated approximately between 1500 and 1800, and 86 in levels 6 to 5 ancien in récent of sounding B to be dated between 2000, 1900 and 1800 and 1650. Up to now, only the tablets from sounding B have been published in MDP 55 by myself. Uh, the tablets from levels 13 to 15 of sounding A are being prepared for publication. Again, they are partly kept at the National Museum of Iran and partly at the Louvre, and again, a small part remains untraceable. So in all, all in all, about only about 830 of the archival Sousa documents have been published up to now and only for a very small part of them, those found in sounding B, archaeological and archival information is available. For the overall majority of the published texts, the archaeological context given in the excavation reports is rather concise and limited, not to say pretty useless for nowadays standards. And apart from MDP 10, in which a coherent group of tablets in all, probabili in all probability found together is published, the tablets have been more or less grouped by genres in MDP 22 to 24, which does not help in the reconstruction of the archaeological nor archival context. And MDP 28 consists of a mixed bag of tablets, leftovers that were not included in the previous volumes. All volumes give hand copies, transliterations and translations, apart from MDP 18, which only has hand copies by Dossin, and part of which were republished in transliteration and translation in MDP 22 by Vincent Scheil. Unfortunately, the hand copies, apart from those by Dossin, are not very reliable, as you can see on this slide. They were not made by Scheil himself, but by a draftsman who was part of the team. So needless to say that from an archival perspective, these publications are rather depressing. Now, I hear you think nothing new under the sun. This is the situation for a lot of material from Mesopotamian sites as well. Indeed it is. But there are some peculiarities that make the Susa texts often a bit more challenging to interpret. They are not dated by means of a year name or eponym system. 
The names of the persons attested show quite some spelling variants and are not consistently defined by patronymics nor titles, and there are only occasionally seals impressed on them, but mostly fingernails, to name but a few of the challenges. So this makes it, first, very hard, if not impossible, to date the text, and second, often difficult to identify the persons attested in the text in order to conduct prosopographical research. If you come to think about it, this of course is not surprising. These texts were written by Susians and thus reflect a local administrative, legal, economic and religious context. And this brings me to my next point, writing and language in a borderland context. The fact that the majority of the archival texts from Sukal Marsusa were written in Sumero-Akkadian cuneiform led to the general assumption that the greater part of Western Iran was Akkadianized and even that the city of Susa was a sort of Babylonian colony whose population was for a large part Akkadian. This theory goes back to Lambert, who claimed that Susiana was Akkadianized due to a mass arrival of Mesopotamians who emigrated from the Lagash and Uma region because of a famine following Amorite incursions in the beginning of the second millennium, hence the predominantly Akkadian character of the onomasticon in the text from Susa. And this view has since then been taken over by many scholars. This hypothesis is in dire need of revision because, first, analysis of the onomasticon of the archival Susa text show a different, much more nuanced picture, and second, the structure, phrasing and content of these texts differ considerably from those in Babylonia. It seems, therefore, unlikely that they were written by Babylonian expats or by Akkadianized locals who simply adopted the Babylonian administrative system. As I have argued elsewhere, I believe the language of these texts to be a locally created officialese using lexical and structural resources of both Akkadian and Elamite developed by Susian administrators to fit their local bilingual and bicultural borderland context. Time does not allow me to elaborate on this here, but it is important to take into account within the context of archival research as local social structures underlie specific administrative and legal genres with specific socioeconomic and religious agents. The preliminary results of a comprehensive analysis of the onomasticon not only shows a much more nuanced picture, but also poses new and difficult questions. About 45% of the names can be identified as Sumero-Akkadian, 15% as Elamite, but a fairly large part of 40% is uncertain. A large number of these unidentified names are hypochoristica, or so-called banana names, names consisting of reduplicated syllables, bisyllabic lullatives, sometimes with suffixes, and so on. These are in general very difficult to allocate linguistically, especially as it is not always clear how to read them in the first place. In all three groups, there, are, there is quite some variation in spellings, sometimes even in one and the same text. For the Samira Akkadian names, apart from the names that have inflected endings, such as El Meshu versus El Meshi, typical variants are Beil Shunu versus Beul Shunu, Damkia versus Bakia, Eadumki versus Eadaumki. The so-called broken spellings clearly show influence of the Elamite language here. But the question is, is Beil Shunu and Beil Shuni and Beil Shunu one and the same person? And what about Damkia and Dakia? For some of the banana names, spelling variations seem to be even greater, as the following examples show. And can we assume that some of the nicknames might refer to persons otherwise attested with their full name? Can Kukia refer to Kukadar and Nuriri or Nuria to Nuramuru? Even in the Elamite names, we see variation as the following examples show. Moreover, especially for the Sumero Akkadian names, often logographical spellings are used, and in particular for divine names, but also for other parts of names. And these logographs can be read in any language. A good example is Dingir Utu. On a few occasions, we know for certain that Utu is to be read Nahunte, the Elamite sun god. But is this always the case? And what about persons who used two names, an Akkadian and Elamite one, according to the context, or names that are translated to fit the otherwise Sumero-Akkadian linguistic context? 
These variations in spelling, typical for naming in a bilingual borderland context, complicate the identification of persons. And add to this that only 25% of all names have a patronymic that, instead of seals, which can serve to identify their users, parties in Susian contracts impress their fingernails, and that most texts are not dated. It goes without saying that this significantly hampers the identification and disambiguation of persons, let alone reassembling documents into meaningful dossiers or reconstructing archive, if that is possible at all. And this brings me to my last point, the witnesses. In our attempts to group texts that lack archaeological and archival context into dossiers, we mainly focus on the persons playing an active role in the texts, being the key figures to whose archives they once belonged and of whose deeds they attest. And one group usually gets less attention, namely the witnesses listed at the end of the agreement, especially as they are often mentioned without patronymic and or title and are therefore not always easy to identify, even in Babylonia. However, witnesses can give us interesting information, not only on the social network of the parties involved in the agreements, but also on how these documents came about, where were they written, and who was present. Witnesses were not listed randomly. Tanré and Surmeyer already showed that temple officials of the Ebabar temple in Sippar often occurred together as a group in witness lists of contracts. By analyzing the place and order of the individual officials in the group over time, they were able to reconstruct the hierarchy, seniority, and succession of these in the officials and their sealing practice over a period of more than 40 years. Analysis of witness lists, the persons mentioned in them, their title, profession, rank, or status, the other witnesses with whom they occur together, and the order in which they are listed, can tell us much not only on the witnesses themselves, but also on the parties who entered into the agreement of which they are witnesses, and the context in which the agreement came about. The idea arose from a somewhat naive curiosity about how the realization and registration of an economic or legal transaction or agreement came about in the second millennium, actually came about. Suppose someone wanted to borrow silver or grain. Did he personally go to the creditor's house? or were there specific hubs in town to borrow money, storehouses or temple facilities? And if so, were creditors personally present there at certain times, or did scribes and clerk notaries took care of everything in their name? And in that case, did it really matter for the debtor who the creditor was, as long as everything was written down and the money eventually was repaid? And what about the witnesses? Were they recruited or brought along ad hoc by one or both parties? Or did they belong to these specific hubs in town? Whose network did they belong to? The creditor, the debtor, the clerk notary on duty? We did this thinking exercise recently for the loans of the Rutu archive within the ECPA project, and it produced some interesting preliminary results, which we hope to elaborate and publish in the future. Now, the analysis of witness lists can also be of use in smaller, more disparate and less understood corpora, and in particular in a corpus like the Sousa one, where we are faced with various challenges. The study of witnesses can help us identify and disambiguate individuals, both within the witness list and the rest of the text, map social and professional networks, and identify persons who function as intermediaries and bridge between networks. And finally, to look at these texts from the perspective of the persons mentioned in them those present at the registration, and the various social and, prof and professional networks they may have belonged to. And this might not tell us whose archive the text once belonged to, if that is possible to find out at all, but it does give an idea in which social and or professional circles the transactions and agreements and their written record came about. MDP 22 and 23 contain a group of lease contracts which often mention the same lessees, at least, lessees with the same names, as they never have a patronymic. Especially a certain Norin Shoshinak seems to have been a very active man in leasing fields to cultivate, to cultivate barley, sesame, and lentils, as well as orchards to cultivate dates. He's attested 14 times. Others are Waratkubi, Awilia, Beli, and Abiili. The number of witnesses in these texts varies from five to eight. 
Now, if we list all witnesses attested in their lease contracts per lessee, we see first that they all have pretty much their own network of witnesses, and second, that their network of witnesses is rather large. For example, in the 14 texts in which Nurin Shushinak is lessee, 36 different witnesses are listed. Eight witnesses, six male, two female, occur twice. Four witnesses, three male and one female, occur thrice. One four times, another one five times, and two of them occur six times. Nineteen only occur once, and not surprisingly, one occurs in all 14 texts. Indeed, the writer of the text, who again, not surprisingly, also occurs in the witness lists of Warat Kubi, Awilia, and Abi Ili. Both Warat Kubi and Nurin Shushinak and Awilia and Nurin Shushinak have some seven witnesses in common. Unfortunately, apart from Damkia, the writer, they do not bear titles. And remarkably, on occasion, the lessees appear in each other's witness list. It seems to us that, although active in the same professional and social circles, they each had their own circle of people around them. So, when we take a closer look at the network of witnesses of one of our key figures, namely my favorite Susian, Nurin Shoshinak, and we add to the 14 lease contracts in which he is a lessee, three more texts in which he plays an active role, two sales contracts in which he's a buyer, and one contract in which he enters in a brotherhood relation in order to transfer property, we see the following. Central in the network is the scribe, Damkia, the big yellow dot. The green dots are the witnesses, ranked from appearing at the top of the witness list in dark green, in the middle of the witness list in mid green, or at the bottom of the witness list in light green. The names in pink are female witnesses or those that could be identified as female with certainty, which is not always obvious given the Susian on onomasticon. And the names in dark blue are the male witnesses. The larger the dots, the larger the betweenness centrality in the network. Again, here we see that the scribe Damkia occupies the central place. But also Nurishtar, Akaliya, and Nur Erra, Damiktu Umi, Abu Thabu, and Ibashu Ilum occupy positions that are pivotal to the network's connectivity, bridging to further social circles. We see that they appear mostly in the middle and top range of the witness lists. However, high ranking in the witness list does not seem reserved only for the closest connected individuals, as can be seen from the smaller dark green dots at the edge of the network. For example, here on the left, where we see a largely female group who seems to form a small sub-network. And very interestingly, when we have a look at the connections of one of the higher connected women in the network, Damik Toumi, who held the priestly office of Shatin, it's an Elamite term for priest, we see that she functions mostly in a male circle. No doubt because of a priestly office connecting her to other high-ranked persons, her colleague Shatin, priests and others, not surprisingly three men who we already know to be central in the connectivity of the network. And when we have a look at one of them, Nuri Shtar, who identifies himself through a matronymic, he's the son of Tsaburtu, we see that they share a lot of connections, but that he serves also as bridge to other social circles. When we have a look at the closeness centrality of the network, we see an overall dense proximity, proximity, which is obvious in a rather small network such as this one, whereas most of the individuals are closely connected. Some of them stand out as controllers and facilitators of the interactions, connecting the different parts of the network as the betweenness centrality shows, and this is corroborated by the modularity of the network, where we clearly see two large and two smaller clusters within the network. This obviously is only a test case, and much more research is needed. This is but a starting point, but the preliminary results of this small network of witnesses can open up many new research questions, both on the level of individuals, what role do the connectors in this network play in other networks, and society in general, how do female and male witnesses relate to each other in various networks. It is clear at least to me, that the analysis of witness lists can contribute much to our further understanding of the archival texts of Susan, 
in a first step to identify and disambiguate persons mentioned in the texts, and in a second step to shed light on the social and professional circles in which the transactions and agreements and their written record came about. Thank you very much.